first year at CUSP, and I have to say that yesterday was so heartening for me. And I had this kind of epiphany because we were all talking about how fear plays a factor in things and how sometimes we're fearful of making mistakes. But what I also realized is that we're very fearful of stepping into our own power, that we are given all these gifts and sometimes we don't step into that power and that all of us have the opportunity to do that. And I guess what struck me was that every speaker yesterday moved me to my core because they had stepped into their power and they were doing things that were incredibly meaningful. I really think that our lives are a culmination of quintessential moments. These quiet moments that you have these epiphanies, these little dots that are out in space that you start to connect in your life because you get these clues, these clues into what you should be doing and these goals and these things that you have to do in your life. I'm going to share some of those clues that I've had in my life. I also have to share with you that I've had some really crap jobs and some bad bosses that really taught me what I don't want to do and how I don't want to be. Dr. Seuss. When I was young, I read my first Dr. Seuss book. And what I realized was that I'd gone on a journey that I'd never gone on before, that he was so inspiring to me. He had a way of spinning them upside down and turning them inside out, and it was a really exciting adventure for me. He was able to step out of his head, and that he came a lot from his heart, and that he took these challenges, and one of the challenges he did with green eggs and ham was that somebody said, could you take 50 words and create a book? And these 50 words that he did actually revolutionized and got kids to read again. It's still the fourth largest selling book ever for children. And when I think about the words, I do not like green eggs and ham, I do not like them Sam, I am, it just really motivates me. Because I think about how you can, you can change things and look at things in a new way and make people see them differently and maybe motivate them to do different things. And so, Dr. Seuss motivated me to have an oath, and that oath was, I vow to eliminate boring and bland, because I saw that there was another way. I have to admit that sometimes when I'm working with my clients, I kind of have to channel this like little superhero, this person that is going to help rescue these, these colors or materials and finishes from being boring and bland, and I'm going to come in and swoop in and save the day. My superpower, I saw The Wizard of Oz when I was 10, and when Dorothy stepped into that Technicolor world, I went with her. And what I realized was that power, uh, the power of color, color can take you to amazing new places. There's this statistic that says that within 60 to 90 seconds of seeing a person, a place, a thing, you make a judgment. Between 60 to 92 percent of that is color alone. When I started going to uh, high school, I realized that I had another love, and that love was science. I love science, so that by the time I went to college, uh, I had a double major. I didn't know if I wanted to become a doctor or a designer. And so um, I double majored, and I was in pre-med, and I remember getting up in the middle of an experiment, and I had made this decision that I was going to actually pursue design. It was this amazing epiphany, but what I did realize was that they're very similar processes, that they share empathy and observation and a love of experimentation, and those things are really, really important in design. I also, I, I think I also felt really um, relieved to know that I could never kill anyone from a bad color, so <laughs> that made me happy too. All along, as I was growing up, I really believed that I would have an idea factory. And when I was a young girl, I just, I didn't even know that the word design existed. It wasn't part of my vocabulary. Because I grew up in Detroit, I, you know, I just thought everything was a factory. I didn't know that there was, there was a studio, so I just thought I was going to grow up and have a, a, an idea factory. And that idea factory is now um, my studio, which um, is in Berkeley, California, and um, I work with a team of people who obviously I adore. My goal is to take all these quintessential moments and to create emotional connection and design. When I go into certain meetings and I'm working with corporate clients, I'm often kind of taken aback that 
we get so talking about products as if they're singular things, as if they're not related to people or that we're not going to interface, or we're not going to interact with them. And so my goal is to create these emotional connections. The shift would be that I would move my studio from being kind of a maker of things into a maker of meaning. I have this toolbox, and this is one of my dilemmas, is how do I explain what I do? I consider myself an experienced consultant, and what, what I do is I have this toolbox of color, materials, finishes, and pattern, and I work and I collaborate with industrial designers or uh, in fashion or in automotive, and I use that toolbox to help create a better experience, something that you would find that uh, it responds to like a human need, and I think that that part is incredibly important. We all have our challenges, we all have our kryptonite. I think that yesterday was a very big day that we talked about fear, and I think that the reason why sometimes people come to our studio is that they do have fear, and they come to us because somehow color is scary to them, and I realize that color is something that nobody ever teaches you in school. I don't, I don't know why, but very few universities teach color. And color, the love of color has to come from not being fearful, right? You have to experiment with color. And um, what I find, though, is that we had to figure out a way to take our clients through a process so that they could really be engaged with us and kind of move with us on this journey. Here's my other kryptonite. Focus groups. I think it's a really dangerous thing to look at focus groups for validation. I think it's a dangerous thing to look outside of ourselves for validation. And um, I'm particularly, I'm thinking that we should have a new design dictionary. And the focus group might be the new F word. And I'm particularly fond of the phonetic pronunciation <laughs> that I've come up with. Because that's what it feels like when you do all that work only to have the fuckus group tell us they don't like that color, they don't like what we're doing in an hour over lunch. I read an article with, about Steve Jobs and nothing made me more excited than when he said they never use focus groups. And that the reason why was because they have a mission, they have a clear goal, and they know where they're going, and they don't need that validation. Here's how we, we kind of work around uh, some of our kryptonite. Everything we get in our studio, we turn it upside down, we turn it inside out. It doesn't matter what it is. It could be a car interior, it could be a toothbrush. Everything is taken apart and put back together again because we need to understand that in order to express like the skin of any surface, we have to understand the heart of it. We have to go deeper. And so what we've done is we've developed this trademark process called climatology. And what climatology does is it takes temperature readings. It's part science, part intuition, part observation. And I have to spend a little time on intuition because here we are, we're born with these incredible gifts called intuition. And yet, we are never allowed to use them. We're, we, we can't, I can't go into a meeting with Toyota and say, I have a feeling you should change your whole production line because green is where it's at, you know? I can't do that. They will never do that. So I believe that you have to use your intuition, but that you also have to have a process to kind of explain it. And that's what climatology does. So what it does is through observation, we go through social, political, economic, and emotional climates, and we track those because what we're really trying to get to is an understanding of what's happening. And I'm not talking about trend, that's the other thing, is that I've really steered my company away from trend because trend is sometimes momentary. And I'm trying to go much deeper than that. I'm trying to understand what is meaningful to us, why it's meaningful at the time. That way I can respond to my clients. What we do is we distill the data into human values. I can give you a really good example. When 9-11 happened here in the, in, in, in the United States, when that happened, there was a fundamental shift to the value that security, security was more important than ever. And that desire for security translated into many different materials and finishes than we would have ever had before. What we do with those values is we kind of manifest them on the surface. And we do business plans, we do all kinds of things, but 
It's the human experience. It's that coming together of science. It's the coming together of technology. It's the coming together of beauty. And I have to say, we, we can't forget beauty because beauty is an important thing. It moves us. That's part of the human experience. So I want to take you through just a couple examples of this. I worked with Floor. He was a creative director for Floor from its inception for about five years. And here was our challenge. In the corporate world, somehow we feel like we don't need to be moved or that we don't need to have stimulation or that beige is kind of important. And so the corporate world sometimes <laughs> gets to be, I don't know why, I don't know why this happens, but our challenge was to try to motivate people to put that in their home. No, I mean, there's no way people are gonna put that in their home. So what we did is we distilled these values. We said, if they're gonna use modular flooring, which was really a brilliant idea, I mean, you could actually pick it up, wash it, do all these great things with it, we needed to understand that people wanted things that were eco-conscious, engaging, and that we wanted to simplify our life. So how do you take this, which is a 19.7 inch square, and make it emotionally engaging? And that's, that's like a good challenge. And so what we did is we, we looked at this square as like the most amazing platform we ever could. We did everything. We, we, we printed on it, we, we divided the pattern, we made patterns in, into repeats so it looked like there wasn't a seam. We played up modularity, and we infused it so that all of a sudden, you might want it and see it in your home. And furthermore, and this is a great story, I was in Ikea, and I had on these shoes, and they were, they were kind of furry. And I was standing in the checkout line, and I felt something at my feet. And I realized, I looked down, and this little girl was petting my shoes. <laughs> and I thought, this is good, because we have a furry carpet that was called Superfloor. Let's call it House Pet. So we called it House Pet. We gave it great names like Tabby Cat. And all of a sudden, when, when customer service was getting calls, it was like, oh, I love Tabby Cat or Gerbil. Oh, that's, oh, I love. And people were talking about it as if it was their house pet, you know? And this was our way of getting to the human emotion of things, to, that all of a sudden it became much more personal. So on the human experience, through design, through color, through pattern, through the way that you would look at the store, the results were staggering. We went out in the market with 14 designs, 10 patterns, four rugs. The emotional response to Floor was so big that the mothership, the $1 billion company Interface, changed their name to Interface Floor. That's how much it resonated for people. And I'll give you just one more example. We love Emico. They make these really amazing chairs, and these chairs are built so well. And the Navy chair was one of the, probably it's, an icon, it's one of their most iconic chairs. So here's our challenge. I don't know why this happens either. Because something's eco, we don't need to know their history. We don't need to know every shampoo bottle that went into it because sometimes it just doesn't look that great. And so what we have to do is kind of deal with these materials and try to make them something better. The eco part of it is great, it's the beauty part of it that, that's challenging. And so what we defined as the values for Emico was heritage, that it had to be substantive and eco-conscious. And the exciting part was that Emico decided that they were gonna partner with Coca-Cola and that they were gonna use, use Coca-Cola bottles to create this chair. So you have two really heritage brands that were creating this chair. And the infusion was to what colors would you really make it? So what we did is we tried to go back to things that were earthy and had a sense of presence. And the result was that the chair had this really kind of earthy presence that it, you didn't know if it had been there for a while or if it was new. That was the real goal. And that it was really respectful of these two brands coming together. And the human emotion part of it was that we got to actually work with the chemists and actually say, could we make this a material that you wanted to touch? That was what was really exciting for us. And so we worked on making it so smooth that people love to engage with it. And then Design Within Reach was the one who actually was doing all of the distribution in North America. And you could see how people were really having a fun time with their chairs. And the result is that three million bottles a year are now reused for the chair. And that was really exciting. And my aha moment was that I spent all my time 
doing these things for companies, but that I hadn't done that for myself. And so I asked myself what I could be doing, what, what, what tools that I had that could maybe be taken further out into the world. I'm launching today um, my nonprofit, which is called Color Core. And Color Core came as a dream that I had about a year and a half ago when I was asked to be a blogger for Fast Company, that I was actually in the White House with the president and I was telling him you know, that I was going into these inner city neighborhoods and that through paint and through color that we were making a difference. And my oath, my new oath is that we believe in the power of color because color is vitamin C. We crave color. It's delicious. It can do so many amazing things. And that we could use color as a sense of well-being and that we could really make a difference. I started small. I thought, I'm going to go around and do random acts of color. I just decided that part of Color Core is going to be random acts of color. And the premise for random acts of color was that I was going to use things that I found or that I had and that um, I wasn't going to ask for permission. I was just going to do it. So two things I learned from this. Number one, in my next life, I want to be the most amazing producer of royalty-free music. I think that would be a really great thing. <laughs> and that sometimes we stop ourselves because we think we have to do these big things when there are these little things in life that actually make people happy and joyful. And nothing made me more excited than to see these people engage. And there were actually little kids pointing to their parents going, tree, tree. And still, this tree is existing. So we'll be doing many random acts of color throughout the year. We got our first color core project, and I couldn't be more excited. I met with a principal from the E.C. Reams Academy in East Oakland, and it serves um, kids that are the most disadvantaged and at risk. And we will be able to go into this school and really make a change and empower them through paint and pattern and that is an incredibly exciting thing for me to think about. And what moved me the most was that these kids were amazing. And every morning at 8.05, Lisa Blair, the principal, gets out there, and they recite their intentions. 
because they have these amazing intentions. And part of them are purpose and unity. This is what we think is acceptable for kids, you know, that, that they can learn in environments like this. Self-determination. They talk about that in the morning as they line up. Creativity, responsibility, and collective work. This is like the EC Reams Academy before, and I'm really excited for you to be posted on the EC Reams Academy after. So for me, this is a, it's a call to action. It's a really exciting time to get involved. And what I'm really hoping is that you go to colorcore.org to see how you can be involved. You'll be seeing signs that Colorcore is coming to your neighborhood soon. So thank you very much. <laughs>